Good afternoon. Can I start by reminding members of the COVID-related measures in place and that face masks should be worn while moving around the chamber and across the uh, Parliament campus. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. Uh, the first portfolio is COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. As ever, if a member wishes to ask a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or put an R in the chat function during the relevant uh, question. Um, there is quite a bit of interest in this portfolio and the next portfolio. I am keen to get in as many members as possible, so please, as ever, succinct questions and answers, please. And question number one is Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government. Okay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the anticipated timescale for the publication of the independent public inquiry into the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Scottish Government will establish an independent Scottish public inquiry under the Inquiries Act 2005 by the end of this year to scrutinise decisions taken in the course of this pandemic and learn lessons for the future. This will include a statement on the appointment of the Chair and the terms of reference for the inquiry that will be made to the Scot Scottish Parliament in accordance with the requirements of the Inquiries Act 2005. The Scottish Government remains committed to working with the United Kingdom Government to develop the approach to the UK-wide inquiry, where possible, avoiding duplication and overlap. Emma Roddick. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. What assurances can he give that the voices of bereaved families will be fully heard during this inquiry? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I am engaging actively with bereaved families in the preparation of the remit of the inquiry. Uh, obviously, the families have had the opportunity sub to submit in response to the consultation we undertook on the terms of reference. I have now had a number of meetings with different groups of bereaved families and will continue that engagement as we progress towards the agreement of the remit of the inquiry. Once the inquiry is established, um, it is a matter for the Chair of the Inquiry to determine what will be the role of particular relevant parties. And it would be wrong for Ministers to prescribe that, but that uh, approach is set out within the terms of the Inquiries Act, and any Chair appointed will operate on that basis. But my own view and what the Government will be setting out to the Chair of the Inquiry is that we want the families uh, that were bereaved during COVID to be central to the issues raised in the Inquiry. Thank you. Brief supplementary. Paul O'Kane. Uh, thank you. Uh, as we have heard, there are thousands of frontline staff, social care users and bereaved families for whom the inquiry will be crucial to get answers on why Scotland was not better prepared. And it is important that those responsible are properly held to account. So will the Minister confirm uh, the inquiry's relationship with the wider judicial system, whether that will be set out in the terms of reference he mentioned, uh, and indeed will that include how it will handle evidence of potential criminality? Government Secretary. Well, the, the, the issue will not be set out in the remit to the inquiry. These are entirely separate functions that uh, the Lord Advocate and the Crown are independently responsible for determining whether there is any issue of uh, criminal consideration to be borne in mind. So the inquiry will have uh, no involvement in and no proximity to those uh, discussions and decisions which are entirely the preserve of the Lord Advocate and the Crown. Question number two, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether, whether it will provide an update on its work in connection with the consultation paper COVID Recovery, a consultation on public services, justice system and other reforms. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the consultation closed on the 9th of November and I am pleased to report that almost 3,000 responses were submitted from both individuals and organisations. These responses will be considered fully as part of the development of the COVID Recovery Bill, which Parliament will have the opportunity to scrutinise when it is introduced later in this parliamentary year. Collette Stevenson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. In terms of the increase in online services over the pandemic, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how these modernised, efficient services could offer ongoing benefits to the public sector, frontline staff and service users, whilst ensuring protections for those without internet access, so that they can still access vital services? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, there is obviously a, a range of developments that have taken place during the pandemic where there has been an increased emphasis on the delivery of services through digital means. So the points that Colette Stevenson make are makes are absolutely valid. 
about the importance of the delivery of efficient services through digital means, but also that individuals are able to access those digital resources and that there should be no impediments to that. Uh, obviously, the government's commitment to improving connectivity, whether that is around the commitment to the R100 contract or whether that is the work on the 4G mobile infrastructure and the mobile hotspots, uh, plus also the voucher schemes that are available to support people who are on low incomes to uh, uh, have access to devices uh, are all part of the government's response to make sure that these services are in place and there is no obstacle to individuals accessing them. Please supplementary, Jamie Green. Uh, something that was not of benefit to the general public was the temporary uh, release of 348 criminals from prisons, of which 40 per cent went on to reoffend. Does that sound like the sort of temporary measure we want to make permanent? Cabinet Secretary. Obviously, there are a range of measures within the bill that are the subject of consultation. As Mr Green will know, uh, the government had to take some difficult decisions during the pandemic around the whole question of early release to provide um, a response to the pandemic. Uh, we will obviously consider, and Parliament will have the opportunity to discuss um, and, and decide whether it wishes to legislate on questions in relation to uh, these matters that were the subject of consultation and there will be full parliamentary scrutiny available for members. I am sure Mr Green will take every opportunity to make sure his voice is heard in that process. Question number three, Sandish Gulhani. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the reported findings in The Lancet that having two doses of a vaccine does not prevent the transmission of COVID-19 and how this may impact its COVID passport scheme. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I recognise the findings of the article published in The Lancet, which found vaccination did not prevent transmission of COVID-19 in those infected with the virus. There have been a number of studies which highlighted that vaccines have some effect in reducing transmission. However, more data is required to confirm the actual magnitude of that effect, and it is likely that it varies with different viral variants, and hence is lower with the current Delta variant. What is clear from the paper, however, is that vaccine does reduce the risk of Delta variant infection and accelerates clearance of the virus. Furthermore, what is also clear from the evidence to date is that we have seen a significant vaccine effect in terms of reducing the risk of serious harm from COVID. That is why it is critical that those who are unvaccinated come forward and receive both doses, and those that are eligible get their booster. The study also highlights the importance of mitigation measures, such as certification, to protect individuals and manage spread of the virus. Sandish Gulhani. I urge everyone watching to get their COVID vaccinations. It is our best weapon against the virus. Uh, we are all in agreement that the science will see us through this pandemic. The Lancet showed no scientific evidence that Scottish Government's COVID passport cuts si significant transmission of the virus. So, in the absence of science, what we have is a policing app, mm. mandated by the SNP and the Greens. Will the Scottish Government end the compulsory use of this app for policing Scottish businesses? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, we will not. Uh, and the First Minister set out yesterday to Parliament the rationale why that is the case. Um, the Government is interested in navigating a, a careful course through a dangerous set of circumstances that we face. We are intent, as members of the Conservative Party are forever telling us, on the importance of ensuring that businesses are able to continue to operate. Uh, Dr Gohani knows as well as I do that the settings in which the COVID certification scheme is applied are comparatively higher risk settings than others, hence the justification for the application of the COVID certification scheme. And uh, as it is our intent to try to sustain those venues for as long as we possibly can do, because the alternative is to apply greater restrictions, which the government does not wish to do so. So that is the rationale for why we are taking the stance that we have taken, and we have seen the COVID certification scheme has contributed towards an improvement in the vaccination level in the critical age group of 18 to 29 year olds. And a couple of brief supplementaries. First, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. Presiding officer, while two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine does not fully prevent transmission of the virus, I have to say I've personally viewed a range of evidence that full vaccination does lower the risk of passing on the virus and of developing serious complications and or hospitalisation. 
Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that the current vaccination certification scheme provides greater reassurance to many members of the public who are considering attending venues or large-scale events covered by the scheme? Cabinet Secretary. The, I, I do agree with that proposition. The vaccination certification scheme is a proportionate measure which will contribute to reducing the risk of transmission and reducing the risk of serious illness and death. In doing so, it will help alleviate pressure on the healthcare system and will allow higher risk settings to continue to operate, as I have just explained to Dr Gulhani. Um, at the same time, we believe it helps to increase vaccine uptake. Uh, no single measure is going to control the virus on its own, so we need a range of targeted measures to keep transmission under control. Vaccines help prevent transmission of the virus as vaccinated people are less likely to become infected and ill and than unvaccinated people, and only infected people can transmit the virus. And Carol Mochen. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of concerns surrounding the COVID passport scheme not being enforced rigorously or consistently at large sporting events such as football and rugby? Um, and how will the Scottish Government address such concerns to allow the COVID passport scheme to have its desired impact? Cabinet Secretary. We obviously engage with the football clubs and the rugby authorities in relation to the application of the uh, the scheme at large events. From the information that I have seen, um, the, uh, uh, all of the authorities are reporting very high levels of participation. We said in the consultation document we did not envisage 100 per cent certification, but we, we do um, place an obligation on the, on the relevant authorities to take the appropriate steps to ensure that there is adequate levels of certification. And from the evidence that I've seen so far, I'm confident that that has been taken seriously by football and rugby authorities. But I think the point that the member has put on the record is an important point to reinforce the necessity of so doing. Question number four, Stephen Kerr. To thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Minister for Parliamentary Business has had with ministerial colleagues regarding steps that can be taken in relation to transparency of its activities to better enable scrutiny during parliamentary business. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and can I thank Mr Kerr for his question. The Scottish Government is fully committed to maintaining its strong track record of supporting effective parliamentary scrutiny. The Government will continue to make appropriate use of each of the routes approved by the presiding officer for making announcements. Stephen Kerr. Thank you. Ministers are regularly making important government announcements via backdoor answers to written questions. Parliament seems to organise its timetable to suit ministers' convenience. Ministers are determining which questions fall within their remit before answering them. And the First Minister reads out scripted answers to scripted questions at FMQs. Deputy President Officer, what is the point? The previous Parliament accepted the Commission on Parliamentary Reform's recommendation that we will review the operation, capacity and effectiveness of the Parliament before the end of this session. Therefore, can I ask the Minister, does he agree with me that we must begin this process now? Minister. Where to start with that, presiding officer? But I will say, when we stick to purely the parliamentary process, and uh, of, over the past number of weeks, uh, the member has said that he has an issue with uh, GIQs, and it is in, it's to ensure that the government activities are brought to the attention of all MSPs and the Scottish Parliament, and it has been used that way in the past. Mr Kerr may wish to reflect on the fact that GIQs are a means of improving rather than reducing transparency, which he seeks. However, I do accept there is a judgment to be made about whether a GIQ is the appropriate means by which Parliament should be informed about government activity or whether, for example, a ministerial sh uh, statement would be more appropriate. I keep that under regular review with my ministerial colleagues and all the members know I am always open to representations on these issues and we discuss them on a regular basis at the Parliamentary Bureau. Question number five, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of the COVID-19 vaccine passport scheme, including on the hospitality sector. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, in line with our legal duty, statutory measures are reviewed every three weeks. We consider the necessity, proportionality and targeted nature of the regulations, taking into account a range of evidence across the four harms. COVID vaccine certification is part of that package of measures. And considering whether the impact on the business sector, including hospitality and society, at large remains uh, proportionate is part of the review. 
Ministers always consider if our measures could be relaxed or ended. However, given the state of the pandemic, we have also been clear that we are considering whether it would be necessary and proportionate to expand certification. Colin Smith. Th thank you, President. Officer. It's not clear to me exactly what the Cabinet Secretary means by proportionate impact, but what we do know is that the introduction of vaccine passport has had a negative impact on hospitality. So could you tell us why there's still no sign of any additional support for the businesses that are affected by the vaccine passport, and the many more that will be when he extends it? And why is the Government now saying that they plan not just to consider a vaccine passport or a negative test for entry into venues, but actually both. What assessment has been made about the potential impact of that decision? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the first thing I need to say is that no decisions have been taken about the extension of the vaccine certification scheme. That will be the subject of discussion at the Cabinet on Tuesday, and obviously Parliament will be advised in the statement by the First Minister on Tuesday afternoon. Um, so, so it, any suggestion from the question from Mr Smith that decisions have been taken is not correct. Um, Mr Smith asked about the question of whether measures were proportionate. That is the test that ministers must satisfy themselves of, of any measures that they are taking proportionate against the scale of the pandemic and the threat to public health. That is, of course, a very material issue upon which ministers have been challenged in the courts and the courts have, uh, in the most recent case, um, not supported those who have um, challenged the government's decision to apply a limited certification scheme in relation to nightclubs and other limited venues with which Mr Smith is familiar. Uh, the government will give um, consideration to um, this issue in, in, on, at the Cabinet on Tuesday. Um, any question of financial support has to be considered within the resources the Government has available to it. Um, and Mr Smith will be familiar with the fact that over the course of the last 18 months, the Government has given in excess of um, £4 billion of support uh, in relation to the activities associated with COVID uh, to deal with the challenges that businesses and other organisations have faced. Thank you. A couple of brief supplementaries, but brief questions and brief responses. First, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I've been contacted by a number of businesses in the hospitality sector extremely concerned that they might be brought under the reach of a vaccine passport scheme uh, due to an announcement due on Tuesday. Is the Scottish Government carrying out an economic impact assessment of the impact on these businesses should the scheme be extended? And if so, will that be published? in tandem with any announcement being made. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as the First Minister said out yesterday, the Government will uh, produce an evidence paper on some of these questions uh, later this week. Uh, we will obviously, the Government has to consider a range of factors to assess the question of the proportionality of the actions that we propose to take should we decide to do so. As I've explained to Mr Smith, that's the legal obligation that we have got to satisfy ourselves of, and it's one that Ministers take very seriously. Thank you. I'm Beatrice Wishart. Cinemas are only just getting back on track yet. We are told the Scottish Government is considering expanding COVID ID cards to cinema attendance. Will the Scottish Government explain to stakeholders why this is a consideration when no outbreaks have been traced back to cinemas? Cabinet Secretary. Well, part of the judgment is about ensuring that we have sufficient resilience in the measures that we have in place to protect wider um, impacts that could be damaging to the public health of the country. Um, we have gone through on many, many occasions the dilemmas that the government is facing, and the principal dilemma is about the damage to, to health. And we have had count, countless, we have had countless demands from even Conservative members, the heckling Conservative members, that we should be protecting public health. And when the government comes forward with measures to protect public health, we get criticism about the measures that we, are, we potentially might bring forward. These are some of the dilemmas. Mr Simpson says there is no evidence. If Mr Simpson wants to ask me a question, he is perfectly entitled to appeal to the presiding officer to be invited to ask a question, and I am always here to answer questions. But what evidence does Mr Smith, Simpson need? Uh, how much evidence of the harm to public health does he need? for the government to have to act. Now, if Mr Simpson wants to stick his head in the sand, he is free to do so. But the government's got a duty to act proportionally to protect the public health of the public. Of Thank the you. And question number six, Sarah Boyack. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the regular and last minute changes to parliamentary business impact on the effective scrutiny that recovery from the COVID 19 pandemic requires. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank Ms Boyack for the question? I can assure the member that the Parliamentary Bureau makes every effort to provide as much certainty as possible with the timetabling of Chamber business. Circumstances can, of course, require business to be changed. In those circumstances and in those instances, proposed changes are uh, um, proposed after full consultation with all the members of the Parliamentary Bureau. Sarah Boyack. Thank you. Would, would the Scottish Government not agree that when we do have increasingly short notice for parliamentary business, it not only impacts on the third sector, businesses and our constituents being able to express concerns and views on the issues we're discussing in Parliament, but it also impacts on our capacity as parliamentarians to be effective in scrutinising the work of the Government. We do realise that there are lots of challenges, but fundamentally it does impact on our capacity to do the job we're here to do. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And Ms Boyack, I, I agree with much of what you've said there. And on uh, average, we try to ensure that we do have as much time as possible uh, to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to do all of that. I will take it on board uh, some of the points you've made, Ms Boyack, and uh, possibly uh, if you mention to your own business managers, bring up at Bureau, so we can have that discussion as well. Through the Chair, please, Minister. Question number seven, Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will undertake a cross-government COVID-19 strategic review into the impact of the pandemic on frontline public services. Cabinet Secretary. So, so the impact of COVID-19 on Scotland's public services, people and places is well understood and has driven the Scottish Government's response to tackling the wide-ranging harms that the pandemic has caused. We continue to work closely with our partners across local government and service providers to closely monitor the impact of the pandemic on services across Scotland, particularly as we prepare for the wider winter pressures. Our Health and Social Care Winter Overview outlines a package of over £300 million of investment in NHS and care services this winter to help address these pressures. The recently published COVID recovery strategy, in addition to specific uh, proposals for the NHS, justice and education, were developed in recognition of the huge impact the pandemic has had on services, workers and the people who use them. Alex Rowley. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. My, my problem is that when it comes to health and social care, that's not what I'm seeing on the ground. What I'm seeing is a situation that is getting worse by the day, never mind by the week. It's absolutely heartbreaking that health and social care authorities are now writing out to older people, vulnerable people, to tell them that their care packages will be cut in order to manage. It's heartbreaking the number of uh, emails and letters and contacts that my office is dealing with. And whilst I accept, because we've had this exchange quite a few times, whilst I accept that Brexit and the end of free movement is, is, is a factor, uh, as is, I'm sure he'll accept, low pay. Question, is please, factor. Mr Rowley. My problem is, what's the plan? I cannot see a joined-up plan for across the, the public sector to try and address these issues. Cabinet Secretary. Mr, Mr, Mr Rowley is correct that he and I have had this exchange, and I, and I know the seriousness with which Mr Rowley brings to these exchanges. And... The, the challenge the government and our uh, local authority partners and service providers are facing up to is about having adequate capacity to deliver the social care support that is required within the community. Some of that is about the fact that there are few people around to actually do that because of the loss of free movement. Mr Rowley acknowledges that is part of the problem and I accept it is part of the problem. The government has already taken steps to increase the uh, the, the, the pay for social care workers. I appreciate Mr Rowley does not believe that that is sufficient, but we have taken steps already to do that. We will continue to keep that under review, and we are in active dialogue with our local authority partners about what further steps we can take to try to improve the situation, because Mr Rowley is absolutely correct in that if we do not address the fact that there are some people who are currently in hospital that could be at home with an effective social care package, we will have a, a greater degree of congestion in our hospitals and therefore will weaken our resilience to be able to deal with, con, uh, with winter pressures and COVID as the months develop. So I take seriously the points that he raises. Thank, and assure thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Question, question number eight, Michael Mara. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with implementing its published COVID-19 recovery plans. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Scottish Government is committed to publishing a plan of how we will deliver and report on the actions set out in the COVID recovery strategy before the end of 2021 and subsequent quarterly reporting of progress thereafter. This plan will be agreed with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities to ensure successful and collaborative delivery to support people across Scotland who have been most affected by the pandemic. Michael Meyer. Thank the Minister for that answer. Today, at the Education, Children and Young People Committee, three witnesses from organisations which represent young people told me that they weren't aware of any significant analysis from this government which assesses the impact of the pandemic on young people's education. Linda O'Neill from Celsius informed us we don't have data we could use where we could look at the before, during and after. It shows us where there are gaps and we have known that for a long time. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister, how can we begin the process of recovery if the Government has not uh, attempted to understand the baseline of the challenge that is faced? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, 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 obviously, I am not familiar with the evidence that was taken by the Committee this morning, but uh, from my own experience as Education Secretary, I am familiar with the volume of data that is available prior to the pandemic, a lot of which was resisted by the Labour Party for it had been put in place in the first place, I would just point out. Um, the Labour Party was completely hostile to the uh, level of reporting that I put in place in relation to these measures. So that exists before the pandemic. Obviously, we have taken a proportionate approach with the education system to ensure that teachers have not been asked to provide um, uh, uh, information on the capacity of pupils when they have not had adequate opportunity to engage with pupils because of the disruption to learning. But the one thing I am absolutely 100 per cent certain of is that every single teacher in the country is focused on ensuring that the learning needs of individual children are being met, and that is something that Parliament should applaud. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We need to now move on to the next portfolio. It is Net Zero Energy and Transport. Again, if a member wishes to ask a supplementary, could they please press the Request to Speak buttons or put an R in the chat function during the relevant question. Uh, we have a lot of interest in this uh, portfolio, so again, please succinct questions and succinct answers, Ministers. Uh, question number one, Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to encourage the public to travel by bus, in light of reports that the recent Transport Scotland COVID-19 transport trend indicate that Concessionary bus travel is down by 35 per cent on pre-pandemic levels. Mr. Uh, Graham Day. Uh, President Officer, COVID-19 has had an unprecedented impact on passenger numbers and revenue across the public transport system. And to date, over £210 million has been made available to the end of March 22 to enable bus operators to maintain services during the pandemic. And we are working closely with bus operators to support the safe and confident return to public transport, which is vital to ensure that there is a viable and sustainable public transport system for the future. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the reply. Uh, Pre-pandemic Scottish Government analysis showed Scottish bus passengers' numbers were falling by 10 per cent on average. Yet, on Lothian buses, passengers' numbers had remained constant. Given the success of this mutual ownership model, is the Scottish Government prepared to give the resources to the local authorities provided for in the 2019 Transport Act? so the rest of Scotland can enjoy the level of service offered by the Lothian buses? And will the Scottish Government take this opportunity to support Scottish Labour calls for free transport for the under-25s? Minister. Uh, President Officer, um, the, the member makes a good point about Lothian uh, buses uh, bucking that trend, and that is one of the reasons why the powers in the Transport Scotland Bill, the full range of powers, uh, are there, and they will be supported by a community bus fund um, in order to extend, um, to extend the implementation of those powers. With regard to the point the member makes about the extension of free bus travel, as he is well aware, from January of next year we have already extended it to under-22s, and as part of the Fair Fares review we will look at um, further opportunities in that regard. Supplementary, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Um, free bus travel for young people in January is going to be really transformative for them and a shot in the arm for struggling bus services across Scotland. But can I ask the Minister how prepared are the communication plans about the scheme? How will schools and colleges be involved? And are we going to see the Minister or some other influencers on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube to get the message out to young people well ahead of the start date? 
Minister, uh, Mr. President, officer, the, the idea of me being an influencer on TikTok f uh, fills me with utter dread. But to answer the point, the point more seriously, um, as Mark Roskill knows, a targeted uh, marketing campaign commenced on the 25th of October to advertise um, the, the, um, the new scheme. And uh, there, there is further work being done, a full marketing campaign, uh, to make young people aware of this. Of course, one of the partners in this whole project is, of course, Young Scott, who are assisting us in that regard. So uh, a great deal of work going into that to make sure that people have the opportunity to access the scheme. Question number two, Russell Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the two Calmac ferries being built by Ferguson Marine. Minister. Uh, President Officer, the Turnaround Director of Ferguson Marine updated the Net Zero Committee on the delivery timetable and budget for 801 and 802 on the 31st of September. The cost to complete the vessels remains the same as reported in the Turnaround Director's December 2019 report. And the delivery of 801 is planned for between July 2022 and September 2022. And the delivery of 802 is planned for between April 23 and July 23. Russell Finlay. At Hull 802 was ordered in 2016, was due originally to be in service 2018. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that it may never see service. Can the Minister today give an undertaking that it will indeed become serviceable on a CalMac route? Minister. Um, as the Transport uh, Minister with responsibility for ferries, what I can say to the member is that we are planning for the introduction of 802 into the service. Supplementary, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. We are all acutely aware that the standing position of the Tories since the 80s has been to close shipyards. The illusory frigate factory on the Clyde is a more recent example in a long list of conservative betrayals of Scottish shipbuilding. Ferguson Marine employs over 400 people, and I wonder whether the Minister shares my views that were it not for the SNP, that shipyard, that shipyard would be closed and these 400 employees would have probably had to seek work outside the shipbuilding industry. Minister. Uh, President officer, uh, absolutely, that is a fact. Um, nevertheless, what we must now all focus on is working with the yard to ensure it has a sustainable long-term future. Question number three, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to encourage people to use public transport rather than cars. Minister. Uh, President Officer, we have a comprehensive suite of measures to promote sustainable journeys instead of private cars in line with our national transport strategy. Our target to reduce car distance travel by 20% by 2020 is truly world leading, and this is backed by our landmark investment in active travel and bus priority infrastructure. And as I noted earlier, we have the forthcoming under 22s a free travel scheme. The second strategic transport projects review will help prioritise investment towards interventions aimed at reducing further the need to travel unsustainably. Katie Clark. Does the Minister think that ScotRail's proposals to cut 300 train services each day are consistent with meeting our net zero targets? Minister. Uh, President Officer, as we have discussed here before, the proposals in, um, that, uh, for next May actually represent a 100 uh, service gain from the the current pandemic situation. Of course, in the long term, we want to see an increase in services, a return of existing services that we had pre-pandemic, and to add to those. But there is no getting away from the fact that right here and now, we face very considerable financial pressures, and we cannot be running trains that are not being occupied. Number of supplementaries. Firstly, Gillian Martin. Thank you. The Government has pledged to revisit the development of a rail connection between Aberdeen City and Ellen, with a possible extension onwards to Peterhead and Fraserburgh. But even if we are successful in re uh, realising this, it's not going to happen overnight. So with many people having no option but to use their cars in my constituency, what is the Scottish Government doing to allow us in rural Scotland and Aberdeenshire East to rely less heavily on petrol and diesel cars in our everyday lives? Minister. Uh, President Officer, there is a very great deal of support going into the North East. In, in that regard, and that you would take very uh, badly if I was to sit, stand and list it all. But what I will say to the member is this, that we work very closely with Nest Strands on all of this, and they have a mass transit proposal for the Aberdeen and wider Aberdeen area. And if memory serves, contained with that are some proposals, for example, to improve 
uh, bus connectivity to Ellen in the member's constituency. And Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If we want more people to use public transport, it has to be reliable. Now, recent incidents of industrial action mean that has not been the case. And the SNP's approach has been to stand back and let the employer and the unions fight it out, even after I showed the Minister contractually the government should have been front and centre. So does the Minister now accept that in, in order to encourage more people onto public transport, the SNP has to take a much greater and more proactive role in industrial action? Minister. Uh, where it's appropriate to do so, President Officer, the Scottish Government will work with the employers, whoever they are, to bring about resolution uh, of industrial actions to ensure that we don't have uh, in, uh, disruption to transport services, whatever uh, form they take. I'm Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The introduction of free bus travel for under 22s from the end of January 2022 will see approximately 1 million young people travel free of charge. This is in addition to a third of Scotland's population who already benefit from the older and disabled persons free bus scheme. Does the Minister therefore agree with me that the SNP Scottish Government have already taken significant steps to encourage the use of public transport? Minister. Uh, President, officer, yes, we have, and, and let's give credit to our Green colleagues for the part they played in the under-22 uh, scheme. But, of course, as I noted earlier, we have the Fair Fares review going on as well at the moment to try and ensure that we best capture opportunities to support our citizens to enjoy uh, easy access to uh, public transport. Question number four, John Mason. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what role passive house homes and off-site manufacturing have in the Glasgow Shettleston constituency in supporting its aim to achieve net zero by 2045. Minister Patrick Harvey. Presiding officer, we do continue to take action to increase the energy efficiency of new homes and to modernise construction to put Scotland's homes on the pathway to net zero by 2045. We're currently consulting on improvements to the high energy standards in Scottish building regulations for introduction next year. Those improvements will be strongly focused on reducing overall energy demand in new homes. And we are also developing a strategy to build more high quality and energy efficient, uh, affordable homes in communities across the country through greater use of off-site construction. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that answer. And I wonder if he would join me in congratulating West of Scotland Housing Association, CCG and Hub West Scotland on the passive development at uh, Parkhead, which I believe is the largest in Glasgow so far, will mean very high standards of insulation and ventilation and will keep heating costs at a minimum. Minister. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, along with many other positive developments, I'm really delighted to congratulate uh, West of Scotland uh, Housing Association, CCG and Hub West Scotland on uh, delivery of uh, this new development at Springfield Cross in Glasgow. Uh, 36 new homes being delivered with the support of uh, grant funding through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, uh, being built to uh, achieve high energy efficiency standards, uh, which will result in low fuel bills for tenants when they move into the complete homes next year. Thank you. Question number five, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it has taken to improve ferry services to island communities. Minister Graham Day. Our £580 million investment in ports and vessels announced in February will support and improve Scotland's ferry services over the next five years. And as part of our wider infrastructure investment plan, we continue to work constructively with partners and key stakeholders to progress a sustainable and efficient fleet placement programme. And I note the recent purchase of the MV Utner, which I'm pleased to tell the Chamber has arrived in Scotland and will shortly uh, begin her fit out. And we, of course, continue to look at the opportunities to bring other uh, second-hand tonnage into the fleet to improve reliability and availability. Engagement with stakeholders to develop detailed deployment, cascade and related timetables for the 2022 summer season continue. Rhoda Grant. The Minister will be aware of a number of cancellations due to crew testing positive with COVID-19, and these cancellations are obviously at short notice. Can I ask what steps the Scottish Government are considering to minimise the risk of ferry cancellations in the event of a positive COVID cases within the, the crews over the winter months, when infections are high and likely to rise, and when ferries already face disruption due to weather? Minister. It's a very fair point the member makes. I'm pleased to say that I had discussions just yesterday with Calmac management on this very matter. She will appreciate that the, 
the primary consideration when something like this happens is, of course, the health and well-being of the crews, and we have to take essential measures. But we are uh, actively looking at whether we can assist them in terms of speeding up the testing procedure to minimise the disruption for the vessels, and also the aspects around deep cleaning and what we can do there to try and ensure that um, disruption is minimised. I'm not at all surprised at the considerable interest in the issue around ferries. There's a number of supplementaries. I hope to get through as many of them as possible. But again, brief questions and brief answers. First, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Lachranza to Clunig ferry route is vital to the Isle of Arran, not least when the ferry from Brodick to Ardrossan cannot sail. Yet in the winter, it is replaced by a once-a-day service to and from Tarbert. What steps will the Minister take to extend and enhance this vital service? Minister. President officer, I am very much aware of the request from our and stakeholder groups to extend the winter timetable between Lochranza and Clinic. As Mr Gibson is aware, however, this request has been considered several times previously by CalMAC and Transport Scotland. And I, and I, I want to assure them that this was looked at in very great detail, but it is simply not possible to operate a reliable service in the winter due to the nature of the slipway at Clinic. Uh, CalMAC has also looked closely at the request to provide more sailings from Tarbert to Lochranza. But again, Mr Gibson will know that any such deliberations need to factor in benefits set against disbenefit for separate populations. In this case, more sailings from Tarbert to Lochranza would mean reducing the Tarbert Port Vary timetable, and this would be problematic for regular users of this service, including children and young people who use it to get to and from schools. Graham Simpson. Thank you. We learned today that full lifeline ferry services to Harris and Uist will not be reinstated next summer. The Harris Forum say this could cost their island three million pounds a year in lost business and they want a meeting with the Minister. Will he commit to meeting them and reinstating the full ferry services? Minister. President officer, I uh, actually met the uh, Isle Harris Transport Forum uh, just a few months ago and I, I understand entirely the concerns they have in this regard. What is happening currently is that my officials are engaged with CalMAC to see if it is possible to arrive, a, uh, arrive at a compromise around this issue. The costs involved in providing a full service, both in terms of using the MESDEC and the full weekly services, are prohibitive, to be honest. However, we are uh, keen to see if we can find a compromise here, and my officials will engage directly on that. Thank you. And Alistair Allen? Thank you, Presiding Officer. CalMAC, uh, as uh, the Minister has uh, indicated, are consulting on two options for that service, the UEG Triangle timetable, which have no additional cost implications but do result in less capacity than in previous years. Given how busy this route is in the summer months particularly, can any consideration be given uh, to alternative options which would see uh, an increase rather than a decrease in capacity? Minister. Uh, President officer, um, that is what is happening at the moment. Indeed, I, Mr Allen wrote to me earlier this week, this week, and one of the suggestions he's made is one of the things that's been looked at as a possibility. Thank you. Beatrice Wishart. Will the government commit to expanding the free bus travel scheme to internal ferries for under-22s in island communities, as they rely on ferries in the same way as their mainland counterparts rely on buses. Minister. Uh, uh, officer, as, as the member knows, indeed, you know, uh, responsibility for uh, inter-island ferries uh, lies with local authorities. Uh, however, all uh, fares uh, for ferries and others are form part of the Fair Ferries Review, which is forthcoming. Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The purchase of the MV Utna in October is the latest instalment in a series of investments in our ferry services, vessels and infrastructure by the SNP since 2007. Despite the vessel reportedly being earmarked for the Oban Craig Newer run, I wondered whether the Minister might detail how other island communities will benefit from this addition to the CalMAC fleet. Minister. I am delighted to say that the UTNA has uh, arrived in Scotland this week and I look forward to seeing her enter service. Yes, she is earmarked for the Oban Craig New route, which will enable a year round commutable service from all alongside the larger vessel serving Oban Craig New customers. The potential additional benefits for our introduction in uh, include the return of the Karusk to the Malik Armadale route, improving service frequency, as well as freeing the MV Lord of the Isles to operate solely on the Malik to Loch Boysdale route. With the addition of the UTNA, freight resilience during January periods will also be improved. Thank you. We need to now move on. Question number six is not lodged. Question number seven, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it sees as the sustainable development opportunities emerging from the decisions and outcomes of COP26. Cabinet Secretary. 
In advance of COP26, the Scottish Government recognised our moral responsibility to respond to the urgent need for global action on loss and damage. That is why the First Minister announced a £1 million partnership with the Climate Justice Resilience Fund to help some of the world's most vulnerable communities prepare for and adapt to climate change, tackling structural inequalities and recovery from climate-induced loss and damage. Responding to calls from activists and young people from those communities throughout the course of COP26, the Scottish Government will treble rather than double our Climate Justice Fund, including £1 million to specifically address loss and damage. Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could outline plans the Scottish Government has to promote sustainable and ethical pension options for public sector workers and whether the Scottish Government considers pension investment an important avenue through which we can boost business and sustainable and ethical models and whether they are operating in Scotland or further afield. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, uh, one of the, uh, of, of the five Scottish uh, public pension schemes, uh, four are unfunded and therefore uh, do not make direct investments, uh, and only the local government uh, pension fund is one which is funded. It is clear that environmental, social and uh, corporate governance issues uh, can affect the performance of investment portfolios, and we are aware that some Scottish local Government pension funds have already signed up to the principles of responsible investment and exercise a, pres a pref preference in new investments with positive ESGs uh, and uh, set that out within their financial criteria. Um, I can also inform the member that Scottish ministers intend to liaise with the Scottish Local Government uh, Scheme Advisory Board uh, with a view to launching a consultation on climate risk reporting and on ESG standards for local authority pension funds in line with the recommendations from the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure for companies uh, to describe the impact of climate-related risks and opportunities on organisational business, strategy and financial planning. And I can assure the member that we intend to progress this work um, in a timely fashion. Thank you. And question number eight, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is engaging with oil and gas businesses in the North East as Scotland transitions to a net zero economy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government engages with companies operating in the oil and gas sector across the North East, recognising the sector and supply chain's knowledge and experience will be, an, will be important for developing and investing in new and emerging technologies. Ministers engage regularly with a range of stakeholders, including the Scottish Council for Development and Industry, the Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, and most recently I chaired the Oil and Gas and Energy Transition Strategic Leadership Group on 19 August, which was also attended by the Minister for Just Transition. Uh, the Minister for Business, Trade, Tourism and Enterprise is also scheduled to meet with the Chamber of Commerce next month. Audrey Nicholl. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. My constituency of Aberdeen South and North Kincardine is home to a range of businesses, many family run, that have been part of the oil and gas sector supply chain for many decades. Many have skilled workforces, established suppliers and a knowledge of the energy sector. What support will the Scottish Government provide to ensure opportunities within the renewable sector will be available to businesses such as these in order to project jobs and support the local North East economy? Cabinet Secretary. We already provide significant support for the economy of the North East, and I recognise there are specific sectoral challenges facing the region, uh, but there are also uh, significant opportunities. Uh, that is why we have committed some £500 million to a new Just Transition Fund for the North East and Murray over the next 10 years, and are also calling on the UK Government to match that investment. Uh, the Scottish Government's £75 million Energy Transition Fund will also support our energy sector and the North East over the next five years. These funds will help to protect uh, existing jobs and create new jobs by opening up opportunities through energy transition and harness the private sector funding 
and support a thriving uh, uh, sector. I can also say to the member that as part of our Scotland Round Leasing Programme, which is the I believe one of the largest offshore wind leasing programmes in the world, that those bidding to take part in that programme are also required to submit a supply chain development statement setting out how they will use the domestic supply chain to support any developments which they may be awarded. And the purpose behind this is specifically to help to secure greater investment in our domestic supply chain and to support the very businesses that the member made reference to within her constituency as we transition from an oil and gas sector to one which is much more dominated by renewable energy. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions. Can I thank members and um, both ministerial teams for their cooperation in allowing us to get through as many questions as we did. There will be now a slight pause before we move to the next item of business.